My name is Tylon J. Sawyer. I am a visual artist born and raised and living in Detroit, Michigan. I went to Eastern Michigan University where I received Bachelor of Fine Arts uh, with a double concentration in drawing and painting. After Eastern Michigan University, um, I moved to New York to attend grad school at the New York Academy of Art, Graduate School of Figurative Art. It's a really long name, but it's an awesome school. And while I was there for my thesis project, my research for that, I ended up winning a fellowship to study at the Royal Academy of Art in London. And I did that for a little while and then came back to the States and finished my thesis project to be awarded my master's degree, MFA in painting from the New York Academy of Art. My work in terms of its subject matter centers around blackness and the intersection of race, pop culture, politics contemporary pop icons in addition to past pop icons to make commentaries on what it means to be an American, specifically from a black perspective. Ironically enough, a lot of my influences aren't necessarily black artists. One of my favorite painters is Vincent Desiderio, Jenny Savile. There's even a writer, Chuck Palin, who makes these very sort of irreverent stories, which I kind of see as metaphors for where we are as a country. And I try to think about that when I'm creating the subject for my own work, maybe taking some, some type of subject matter, which may seem very intense or traumatic in a way, but presenting it in a way that is palpable to anybody who can look at it without the trauma, but they're able to dissect the content of it, I think in a meaningful way with the trauma filtered out of it, hopefully. We live in a very heavily image-based society where these things are constantly coming at us via social media, via the news, Twitter, etc. And so what is it like when you are constantly ingesting these things, in addition to the books I read? And, and you have to sort of like translate that into something that when somebody is looking at it, hopefully they can have a visceral reaction to it, or hopefully they're able to at least understand it from a purely intellectual level or understand its poetry and appreciate its beauty in that way. And so not only in terms of the subject matter of my work, like is that what happens, but also in terms of just the aesthetic of my work. And I'm thinking about, you know, where I may put an arm, how, what, what the character in my work will dress, what the light's gonna look at. And all of those things where it may just seem like something that's meant to, to make the piece look pretty, but those things kind of create secondary and tertiary sort of like meanings in the works that I'm creating, what I want the viewers to get from my work. I did this series called Golden Boy, which is a series of drawings influenced by Whitfield Lavelle's Ken series. He did a series of found photographs and sort of like reinterpreted them like in a way to give them new meaning. I more or less wanted to, it was at a time where prior to the Golden Boy series I did, I was doing large scale portraits of people of color, trying to make them as beautiful possible as a sort of an inoculation against the negative images of people of color. And so with the Golden Boy series, I wanted to pay tribute to black men who perfected the history of the United States in some way, shape or form. But at the same time, while it is paying tribute, it is not a tribute that is completely revelatory, like in terms of like praising them because it takes more of an objective stance about their actions and what they've contributed to this country. And just like all humans, it's a complex narrative. So a, per this, you know, like a person who does something great may also do something extremely extremely terrible. And these two things can exist in the same body, you know? Um, and this is something that is indicative pretty much of all mankind. And, and that's another meaning in my work in terms of thinking about that, like the complexities of being able to deal with the, the good and the bad and how that just moves us along as, like, as a people. And so with the Golden Boys, I did this series of drawings, um, just single heads of charcoal drawings with a variety of people, Jean-Michel Basquiat, James Baldwin, Thurgood Marshall, and many others. And then I used, gave them, did these really tightly rendered charcoal portraits. And then I gave them gold leaf for the eyes, which kind of added this sort of like ominous feel to it. But that was more or less a commentary on that these men have value because gold is seen as a precious metal. And when you look at that, you should kind of look at it as that even in internally where the face is tightly rendered and the eyes makes it, kind of gives it this mass feel, which is sort of reminiscent of my other works, but it also shows that these people have a type of internal value, you know, despite the complexities of what their lives may have been. I use a lot of masks in my work. Certain sub-Saharan African tribes, they actually will use masks more or less as wearable sculpture as opposed to the masquerade masks that we see quite often in the West. But in Africa, these masks are sort of like totems or ways for people in certain tribes for them to communicate with either their ancestors or animal spirits. Um, like there's an alligator tribe who worships um, an alligator and they will wear this, somebody would put on the mask and become imbued with the spirit of this sort of like river alligator. And then there are other masks which are representative of 
ancestors and more or less that would say that's where my wheelhouse is sort of like where I try to steer my research in towards. And so about two years ago, I started like incorporating the flag and other types of American iconography into my work because maybe it's a, a shift in our political system which has made me think about my place as an American um, and what is it like to be a black American. Somebody brought up, used the word patriot to a certain degree. I wouldn't describe myself in that, but I do love this country. It's the country I grew up in. I've lived other places and I know like I like the United States, but it's because I like it and love it so much is why I criticize it and take it to task for these things. Because I think if you love something, you should be able to criticize it and interrogate it, you know, to the point and be honest with it. When I look at America and the iconography of what that flag is, depending upon the context of where I see that flag, it may make me think a, a different thing. I am very careful, and I've done this before, but I've been really good the last couple of years not to make work that is reactionary. Even with the, for example, like the current issue with the death of George Floyd, you know, we got to see this, how traumatic that was, but not to jump out and try to make a painting that's about that. And it's always to step back and look at that this, because what happened to George Floyd is not a unique phenomenon. I want to look at the bigger picture, and then what are the smaller things that are driving this big picture that are putting it together? And I try to make work there. So when you look at one of my paintings, you're not just like, this is a thing that happened in 2020, but you can go back to 1960 and see that this thing was happening, or you can go back to 1840 and see that this thing was happening. And it's like, why aren't these things getting better? And similar to, I said, the metaphor for the butterflies and how racism evolves, these things aren't getting better. They just change and look different from different time periods, but it's the exact same thing. The state-sanctioned death of a black man is the state-sanctioned death of a black man, whether it's lynching in the woods or whether you have your knee on the back of his neck being filmed. Like, it's the same thing. It's just different clothes, pretty much. American icons like Uncle Sam and Columbia. These are people who have traditionally been cast as myths to, um, they're almost metonyms for, for like this American ideal of like patriotism, freedom, America's military might. America always takes in the poor and disenfranchised despite the contradictory nature of what may be happening currently politically. And so what is it like when you take these roles which have traditionally been relegated to people who look white and you replace them with black actors? And that's all that I'm doing is replacing them with black black actors and recontextualizing them in this patriotic way, but literally just black skin in and of itself complicates that narrative and turns these images into something else. And I'm very aware of that. And so when I do it, it's intentional because it should be engaging on multiple levels. I have a painting called Uncle Sam, uh, American Gangster Uncle Sam, where instead of traditional old white man, which was a original image came up by uh, J.M. Flagg, who was an illustrator, I think in the late 1700s or early 1800s, and he actually came up with the icon for what Uncle Sam was. Instead of a traditional white man with a flag suit on, what's it like when you take a cool black guy, give him a pistol in a joint, and he's still looking at you at that same way with the same type of, I want you, but the pistol represents military might. But because we understand like the stereotypes and things that are placed upon black people, it changes the narrative in spite of what my intent is. And I'm conscious of this. And I want to make work which is challenging on both of those levels, because if I can believe that this still represents America's military might, but it's from somebody who looks like me. So my experience is completely different than any experience I have had encountering a poster of Uncle Sam, you know, saying that I want you to join the military in a way. Like it just shifts the narrative. As a black American, it's really, especially right now, it's really, really important for me to, to do work that deals with that. So Columbia was another painting, which I would say is the companion piece to Uncle Sam. They're both companion pieces. But Columbia, most people, is traditionally like a name most people don't really pay attention to or really notice in the grand scheme of what we think about American history or American icons. Whereas had this been the 1800s, prior, actually prior to 1924, before Columbia Pictures adopted Columbia as their logo, Columbia would have been something that was just as familiar as Uncle Sam, the way that we think about it, or used as a metaphor to describe things like Freedom. But Columbia was this blonde white woman with who was sort of like representative of America's ability to take care of the poor, disenfranchised. There were J.M. Flagg, again, an illustrator. There were tons of illustrations of Columbia freeing slaves, freeing people, you know, like poor, despite a time where we know slavery was legal in this country. And you would see this contradiction, like in the type of imagery. And the Statue of Liberty actually is an image of Columbia, you know, um, like it's Columbia and Liberty, these, these images are interchangeable. And so 
So thinking about Columbia, like something that seems somewhat obscure in terms of its meaning to the United States, I wanted to readopt that. Instead of having a blonde white woman with a torch, I changed it into, you know, like a beautiful black woman holding a baseball bat, standing in front of a flag. Because Columbia has all, which I think is ironic, if Uncle Sam represents America's military might, Columbia is sort of like Ameri America's sort of like fortitude in terms of like what it would take to carry out that military might and to stand for it. And so rather than what I would say a blonde woman holding a torch who should convince me that she's gonna have the fortitude to protect us, I think a black woman giving you a stern look with a baseball bat gives more of that type of impression. Once again, pop culture references. If you saw Beyonce's Lemonade video, she's got the baseball bat that said hot sauce on it. And so, you know, I'm thinking about these things, like the way that pop culture goes. So it might not be something, if you've never seen that, you might not notice it, but somebody who's a Beyonce fan will see this pop culture reference in the context of this fine art painting in a gallery. And I think it's important for art to work on those levels, you know, to engage people. The work that I make, because it is so heavy, like intellectually, I want to know as much about it so that I can simplify it into something that is very, very palpable to somebody who's looking at my work. Now, all my work isn't didactic. It's not always teaching you a lesson. All of my work does have a type of intellectual foundation that takes heavy research from that. It may take reading a 500 page book, but that's what the work looks like on my end. And that's actually almost just as enjoyable as the painting part to me, because I'm sometimes fascinated or quite often like fascinated at things that I just did not know. Pop culture, no matter what, black people, we've made significant contributions to this country. And so I'm very fortunate to that I have tons of material to draw from to keep this series going for as long as possible. When I'm doing this type of research, this is really for like my own benefit, like my own for like, this fascinates me that these things have happened. I had known about Stone Mountain, Georgia, but when I did the deep dive to find out like how much time, energy, money went into it, like that was something I never knew about it. And it wasn't until I presented the painting and I gave a talk at U of M, I found out how many people didn't even know that this sculpture existed in the first place. People in Georgia knew, you know, and I had even received like some emails or messages via social media where people had known about it. Same thing, climbing up the mountain like every day, but didn't really understand what they were standing on top of. To understand one of my paintings, you shouldn't have to re do as much research, but hopefully it makes you want to do that type of research. I always tell people, I want people to think, I want people to pay attention to the world that's around them, you know? And that's all I'm doing, trying to, to focus more on the world around me, to pay more attention and put that out there so that we can see. There's a story, a short story I read in college called Those Who Left Omulus, right? Now, Omulus was the story like this magic city where everything was perfect, everything was beautiful. People had magic carpets, there was food, everything was, you know, just flying cars. It was amazing, right? But Omulus was this magic city and it was predicated on the suffering of this little boy. And there was this little boy in the middle of the city who was like this closet. And through magical means or whatever, he had to sit there in his like own, you know, waste and everything, he had to suffer. And in Omulus, in order for these people to enjoy this kingdom, everybody when they became of age had to learn the truth about this little boy. To know that your perfection, everything that you have is predicated on the suffering of this child. And so the story kind of talks about the idea of people who had left Omulus. And you know, some people went to New York. I don't know where Omulus is, but there were certain people who were not able, you know, under their own conscience to deal with that, right? And that's, that's pretty telling. And a lot of my work kind of does with that. Like if I reveal this truth to you, this pretty magic kingdom that we call the United States, you know, and we think everything is beautiful and perfect but when you put it in a way and you take somebody and say this beautiful pretty kingdom that you live in is predicated on the suffering of these people and these things are you still able to live there and deal with it and as many people say that they can't i notice that they're still here on their phones checking their facebooks So two years ago, I had an exhibition, American Gods, which sort of, I would say, started the, the iconography of the work that I'm using now with the flags and the symbols of America. And then I would say probably one of the hi highlight or cornerstone pieces in that show was a painting I did called Pieta. But it's of um, a woman holding her son who is in sort of repose. You don't know if he's deceased or not. I try not to put those types of, that type of imagery in my work where you see dead bodies and things like that, because I don't want to traumatize myself, much less view. And that's not how I want to represent people who look like me. But um, these are actors, so it's a woman and her son sitting in front of the American flag and just looking at us, you know? And Pieta, I'm taking this from the Renaissance period. Pieta is Italian, it means pity. It's one of the, I think the four, one of the few images of the Virgin Mary you will ever see sad. And whenever you see the Virgin Mary holding Jesus after he's been deposed from the cross, that's considered a Pieta. And it's used in movies and things like that. You'll see the pose, but in this respect, I've never seen it used with 
a black woman holding her son in that way, but I was thinking about like in this way, I wanted to do a painting, which I wanted to do a painting that addressed violence, but without being a violent painting. I was thinking about like Trayvon Martin and sort of how he's become a metonym for state sanctioned violence against little black boys and you know, like just men in general. And so I actually had a friend of mine, you know, like asked her would she be the sitter for the painting? And I actually asked, you know, like would her son, you know, like would he participate in this? And this was interesting where we had to actually have a talk with him and talk about what the painting was gonna be like. I showed him references of what traditional pietas had looked like from Michelangelo's pieta to Bougaro's painting of pieta to Titian's. And so we looked at a variety of these things. My friend, she told me flat out, if her son, you know, didn't want to do this, he felt uncomfortable, it would not have been something she would have posed for. And so he said it was okay, and we set up, and I used, you know, we set up reference photos, made sure everyone was comfortable, um, and I set up this image, and I set out to paint it. And my idea was to create something that was beautiful, but it would still, it would, it would make you think about violence, but you, you shouldn't see blood, you shouldn't see guns, you shouldn't see a deceased body in that way. But you should think about these things because this is an American problem, not just a black problem, but it's an American problem. And so a lot of times when I, we use this word trauma and I think it's thrown out there too heavily. The world itself is, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty intense, it's, a pretty, it's pretty bad out there. Sometimes something that one person may see as trauma can be just a problem that another person sees to solve. And trauma is a thing where I, I see, sometimes can stagnate you, right? But when something's a problem, it's just a thing that needs to be solved, it needs to be fixed. And I think about that, like in terms of like gun violence against people who look like me. And so there are tons of systemic changes that hopefully people can see this in, in the grand scheme of themselves as Americans. That's why I use this type of iconography, like flags and things, so that people, if you're looking at it, if you're an American, you're not divorced from these things that I'm talking about, no matter what your skin color is or what your background is and hopefully you can see that it's just as important a subject for you to tackle as it is for myself or any other black person. It was a religious subject but I made it more of a secular one which deals more with something that happens in the United States a way too often. Like I said two years ago I started um, the series sort of using American iconography with this show called American Gods named after a novel by my, one of my favorite writers Neil Gaiman um, but the novel was about American Gods it's a work of fiction and it's a it's a work about um Whereas people, as they started to colonize Americas from different countries with different faiths, they would bring their gods with them. This, it's a work of fiction, so you're assuming these gods exist. Think of Odin, think of Loki, you know, like Norse, jo Norse gods. Think of um, Vishnu, you know, if you go to India. So as people moved to the United States, as the country actually turned into the United States and, and America and started to evolve and become more secular, people sort of started to abandon their gods. And so these gods were sort of like left to their own devices to roam and, what that looks like and the book kind of deals with that. And so I was thinking about that as a metaphor for what it was like for black people being brought to America involuntarily. And then through civil war and a myriad of other things sort of left to our own devices to kind of into the wilderness of this crazy country that we live in. And so I just used that as sort of like the starting point, like for what that body of work was gonna be. And even though I've done paintings, I've done drawings and things like that, which have shifted somewhat subject matter, it all still kind of falls <laughs> under the same umbrella because, you know, I'm dealing with issues that happen in a black community, but they're truly uniquely American. And it's fun. You don't see this type of gun violence in other countries. You just don't. You don't see this specific type of race, you know, like being subjugated like in other You just don't see that like the way that you see here. Like America's very unique in this type of repression and oppression that it does to people like me. From that series, um, there were, I mean, there are a few different things. Pieta was one. I did a piece called Post Hope, a, a, a sort of like a a guy in repose, you don't know, like he's, it looks like he's falling down and you can't see his face, but he's holding a mass of Barack Obama. And then he's laying on top of an American flag. And it's, it's just a, you know, tightly painted American flag. But whereas you look at the bars that are white, there were collaged elements that I ended up downloading from the um, Library of Congress. And so I'd finished the whole painting. There was some, you know, to me, it just looked like a pretty picture and there wasn't, it wasn't heavy enough to sort of get the idea that I wanted to think about like Barack's legacy is sitting on top of all this history. And so I went to the Library of Congress website and I essentially just typed in African American and literally all these images sort of came out. And it was fascinating to go through, I'm talking like the earliest photography from the girl types of like slaves to most, you know, like more modern things of Tupac and, you know, ironically enough, Beyonce, although I did not put Beyonce on there. But these are things that you found. But I found the vast majority of the images that actually came from the Library of Congress kind of showed negative things about the 
black community. So it started off with slavery, but you would see civil rights, but it would show people getting attacked by dogs. It would show water hoses. It would show the 80s like drugs. It would show like just all of these things that if somebody had never seen a black person and this was their introduction to it, they would, I can see how they would have like a negative connotation about what we are. And that just fascinated me because the Library of Congress is the collective memory of the United States in a way. And it's like, this is how the US remembers black people. And so I took those images and put them like between the, the on the white bars of the flag to show this ideal of like, yeah, this concept of what Barack had and we had hope because we live in this hashtag, let's make a sane type of slogan, um, sort of like generation, but Despite that hope, what happens post hope? He's still sitting on top of all that history. And as we can see today, it's, you know, like the same things, stuff still happens in spite of that one great blip that we had on the radar. Every single thing that I make, it's multivalent in that way. I want it to have a type of integrity to where, if you want to do the work, if you can do like, it's going to give you that where you can do the research and you can look at it and we can talk about it. And if you, but if you want, if you want to appreciate it for its beauty, hopefully you're able to do that as well. And so like the previous exhibition, American Gods, um, I actually had the privilege to create a short film called American Gods in a, when I say motion picture, literally like in terms of you've seen the, the paintings from the show, it's sort of like those were fleshed out into a cinematic world where um, a friend of mine, LaShawn Phoenix Moore, she was sort of a vocalist and we found this really beautiful church in downtown Detroit and we put her in the church and she sung the black national anthem, lift every voice and sing to an empty church while you start to see scenes recreated of the painting that I did Pieta and then I did a drawing called DNA, which kind of talks about the connection of protests throughout history. And so we recreated that scene actually live throughout the footage into one like cohesive film. And I really saw it as sort of like a motion painting, like in a way, which described my work. I was happy that was shown um, in downtown Detroit on the TFC Center. Like when you're getting on the lodge, you could see it on the large jumbotron. And ironically enough, last year it won for best short film at the Detroit Free Press Film Festival. And so expect more of that to come in the next show. I'm working on this series called White History Month. I did volume, White History Month volume one at the very end of last year. I had a residency at U of M, but it's meant to be somewhat sardonic, but at the same time, very serious. We think about like Black History Month. We have it in February, shortest month of the year. Blacks always talk about that. And it's the one time where all companies decide to put, you know, let's back black people and let's do these great things and to, to support black people. Soon as that last day in February is gone, it's back to business as usual. And I, so I just thought of the irony of, well, since every day is White History Month, what happens if you just make like a white a show that engages white history on purpose, you know? And people thought it was crazy when I was doing this, but the show, all I'm doing, I'm mining from Western art history and, and history in general, and essentially bringing forth um, obscure truth or sort of like revisionist histories and trying to reorganize them in a way that, I don't know, gets to some type of truth right now. How I even came up with that, uh, I was working on the stuff of this show. Last summer, I took a trip to New York and I was in the Met and I was I was chilling in the Met right before, because my it was like a few hours before my flight. So I was in the Met and I was walking around and I got to see the sculpture by Alberto Bocioni called Continuous Forms in Space. It's one of the most famous Italian futurist sculptures, got made out of bronze. It looks like a figure's running so fast that he's breaking a platform. I was checking out the sculpture and I was thinking about, you know, like this one of the best works by Italian futurists. And as I was sitting there looking at the sculpture, it hit me, I was I was thinking of, you know, like it was in the news what had just happened in Charleston about people trying to tear down Confederate monuments and talking about how the United States had all this racist artwork around and paid tribute to it. And as I'm sitting here checking out this Italian futurist sculpture, it dawned on me, I was like, wait, the Italian futurists were fascists. They actually believed in Mussolini's dream, which was sort of akin to Hitler. And when I was thinking about that type of work, like at the time, I was just like, and it just blew, like I started looking around around and met like, do they know that this is out here? Like this, what this work actually like was done by. And thinking about how like, how much of that type of work is in museums and around the world that it gets a pass because it means something in the grand scheme of art history where somebody's able to put forth a compelling argument to say that that work should be put out in public despite what the intent or the, the, the politic of the person who actually created that thing. And I swear, I looked at the sculpture, I was like, oh, white history. And then it just kind of like, white history month. That's what my work, this is what this show is gonna be about. That's literally where my research started, you know, like just started going towards. And I was thinking about what are things that, that, that are in this country that are truly unequivocally white that are essentially living contradictions in terms of what the United States is supposed to be. And so the show sort of used that as the starting point to like just create a few works from there.
using that idea of like, are there images? Are there, are there, what are works around the United States which represents this great contradiction of what the United States says that it is versus what it does? And one of the things, you know, thinking about sort of like the, the violence that took place um, in Charleston a few years ago with the removal of a Confederate monument, it dawned on me as I started to do research, I came across, well not came across, it was something that I was aware of, Stone Mountain, Georgia, but it was sort of a thing that was just in the back of my mind. I had never really brought it to the forefront of my mind and to contextualize it in the grand scheme of my work until I saw this sort of like national push to redact Confederate monuments away from, you know, United States or public view. I brought Stone Mountain, Georgia into the forefront of my mind and thinking about it, like it's the largest Confederate monument in the United States. It's also Georgia's biggest tourist attraction. As I started to do more research in this, I was blown away at the amount of effort that went into getting this large scale sculpture created. To, to see it in person, it's literally carved into a side of a mountain, like the world's largest bas relief. And it has the heroes of the Confederacy riding off into their horses. And the sculpture itself was actually created post-Civil War, actually finished, I think in the 60s, to even show you how modern it is. Like this isn't something that was done during the antebellum period in the US. Like, no, this is a very, very modern representation of what's happening now. And it, it was commissioned by the Daughters of the Confederacy and thinking about the amount of time, energy, and money that was spent creating what I would say is the world's largest second place trophy because the Confederacy lost. And the irony of that, what made me think about that was when you look at something like that and you have to think about the large population that's in Georgia and what that is like for these black people to see this mountain every day. I actually have a friend who I follow on social media and he does hikes up this mountain every day. And that blew my mind, like just the smiles, like, hey, I climbed, you know, I climbed this mountain and thinking like, but you're you're climbing this large, you know, like racist sort of like trophy or like emblem. And that's kind of like the burden of being black in the United States where you almost live in a sort of atmosphere of race. And, and yet we prevail in spite of it. You know, I use this metaphor for, it's like a fish where water is a fish's natural environment. If you take the fish out of the water and put him on the ground, the fish is gonna foil and die because it can't breathe this oxygen. But black people, we were taken out of our natural environment and put into this environment of racism and somehow we've managed to still keep going. And I know that's an important thing, distinction to think about, like what we're still able to do in this particular environment. And so I took the image of Stone Mountain and thinking about what it's like to the, the anxiety of living in this racist environment. And I just put a bunch of black bodies like on top of it, almost as if they were in a bed turning around, unable to get comfortable. In simple terms, it's about the anxiety of being black in the United States when you're constantly confronted with these sort of like images that are supposed to highlight your subjugation. Like I said, the white on white stone mountain, that was, and I would say probably I was in terms of subject matter, my most complex painting that I've done. There's levels to it. We could talk, we could do the whole interview if I kept talking about it. But in the show um, for White History Month Volume 1, I sort of, I use Volume 1 because I'm still thinking about like hip hop when you think about like albums being brought out or I saw that show as sort of like a mixtape of the idea of that concept of what white history was gonna be. And so I sort of like pulled from a variety of different things to sort of put together a show and see like, okay, what is the concrete direction that I want this work to go in? And so I think in the creation of my painting, um, White on White, which was also in being such a, a formalist, tightly rendered figurative artist, I wanted to do something that, a painting that could hold up as a representational painting, but also as an abstract painting in terms of like how the lights and darks move throughout it. So I did the painting, Three Graces Aretha Franklin, which is sort of a commemorative, sort of like piece to honor the queen of soul, Aretha Franklin, but it also makes a commentary in a way on appropriation in a way that white culture has often appropriated black heroes for like their own uses, um, you know, depending upon what the particular situation is. Next year in January, I'm, right now I'm currently working on White History Month Volume 2, which will encapsulate the work from Volume 1, but then have it fleshed out in a more cohesive way. Um, I've started working on these large scale drawings. I did this piece called um, I Reminisce, where adding new iconography into my work. Traditionally, people would see, you're gonna see masks in the show, and traditionally that's something people would see. But I've also started thinking about the ideas of what butterflies represent. And so how butterflies, there's these pretty insects that we see flying around, but you know, in certain cultures in the East, they represent reincarnation. I've kind of created this motif of butterflies with the Confederate flag emblem on them and thinking about sort of how racism constantly evolves in the US. And so you're gonna see images that have that on there, larger figurative images. I'm doing these large scale drawings called strata drawings. And so thinking about sort of historical strata all combined into one picture and what that is like to not place things so carefully or so ordered, but like how history is messy and just on top of each other. And so I'm creating these 
just these multi-tiered drawings in terms of both their meaning and then also like the materials that I'm using. And then hopefully another time-based media sort of like project or movie to accompany this exhibition. It really, it's, it's a lot of work, but it really, really is a labor of love. Um, and I really just can't wait to like share this work with the world. I'm a lucky man that I get to do this for a living. You know. I wanna send a shout out to George and Jamani and Namdi, really for like all of their help and support in terms of my career. I really, really wouldn't have been where I am today without, <laughs> without George. And thank you so much for, like I said, the gallery exhibition. And when people come and you see this type of work, hopefully it overwhelms people with beauty, but also gives them this type of thirst to want to research. And like I said, pay more attention to the world that is around you, to the country that we live in, and to engage, engage our system on an intellectual level, not just to always be reactionary and emotional about everything. Like I said, every day is another day to get it right, and hopefully my work will help us get it right.